All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the UEC. Uh, we're very happy to have Steve Harris and Kimone Jordan presenting today on the challenges and opportunities of increasing tree canopy for tree equity in Syracuse, New York. Steve Harris is the city arborist uh, in the Syracuse Parks Department, and he oversees the management of Syracuse's 44,000 street and park trees in efforts to increase tree canopy. Steve previously worked in the nursery industry and as an urban forest extension educator. Steve holds associates and master's degree in forestry, is a certified arborist and municipal specialist, an MFI grad and current president of the NYS Urban Forestry Council uh, and former board member of the Society of Municipal Arborists. Steve's passion for forestry began as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Gambia in West Africa. And Kimone Jordan is the Director of Housing and Neighborhood Planning in the Department of Neighborhood and Business Development in Syracuse. In that role, she advances the housing and community development investments, investments in Syracuse, manages planning strategy for residential investments, and coordinates community engagement initiatives to promote neighborhood stability. Her recent work has included aligning planning efforts between the Resurgent Neighborhood Initiative and the city's urban forest master plan. So welcome to both Steve and Kimone. Uh, Steve, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, you have the floor to start presenting. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Harris, city arborist. And can you see the speaker notes? No, we can't see the screen. We can't see your slides right now. Oh. They were up for a minute. They were, and then Kamone texted me that you could see the speaker notes. Uh, we can see the speaker notes. You can? Yes. That ruins everything. <laughs> um, before we had it that you could not. How about now? Now I cannot see it. All right. We can, we can see the slides and not the speaker notes. OK. So thank you, everybody, for giving us the opportunity to talk about how we in Syracuse are working through the challenge of trying to increase tree canopy and especially achieving tree equity. Um, we are in the nascent stages of trying to figure out how to do this and how to scale up. Um, we released a draft of our master plan in March 2020 and adopted this plan in April of this year. And there are three primary goals of the plan. The 70,000 trees you mentioned, you saw on the previous slide is what we think it'll take at minimum uh, to increase canopy 7%. Uh, we also want to improve forest health and resiliency through a focus on more proactive management of our street tree population, uh, continued focus on planting a diverse palette of species in our streets and parks, and then, of course, combating invasives in our natural areas and replanting with natives. Finally, and in order to get people to value trees and to know how to care for them, we need to revitalize our education and stewardship programs, which we are actively doing. Um, and just to share how we got to this point, um, I wanted to go briefly over our master planning process. Uh, the Onondaga Earth Corps uh, led the public input process and Davy Resource Group analyzed our policies and practices across departments. This was back in 2019. Onondaga Earth Corps is an organization that provides uh, experiences and leadership opportunities and jobs centered around urban forestry. And the Earth Corps led, oops, sorry about that. The, um, the Earth Corps uh, led, led that process and um, helped us assemble 70 stakeholders that had really good reach into the community and um, helped us pick our steering committee to find them. And then the Davy Resource Group, they uh, led the stakeholder group uh, in the process of learning about what it means to manage a forest sustainably. And after getting calibrated on that, the stakeholder group helped us refine what questions we would ask in our public survey and at our public meetings and, and guided us on how to structure our outreach. 
Onondaga Earth Corps, when they held the public meetings, uh, they did so working with our traditional neighborhood planning groups and also in non-traditional settings to reach people where they gathered. And they also reached out to new Americans and um, then Davey took all that feedback, the survey, the meetings, the investigation into practices and feedback from other departments and that they took that and they put it in the, the analysis funnel and uh, gave us some core strategies, which I highlight here. Those in green are the things we've started doing and those in brown are works in progress and those in red are the things we need to get started. So our tree ordinance has been barely touched since it was written in the 50s. Uh, incorporating canopy goals into our larger planning goals and initiatives is part of what we're talking about today and Kamun will touch on you know, improving construction practices to protect trees, our design standards, we have them now, and we're sharing them with developers during our pre-development meetings. Proactive risk management and it is something that we've really been focused on. We've been doing one six inventories for the last two years, and we've got a new budget item this year for rotational pruning, uh, one six rotational pruning, which is very exciting for us and has taken a long time to get to that point. But we do have to revitalize our education and stewardship programs. And uh, we'll touch on that briefly. But before I do, I did want to give a brief snapshot about our urban forest. You know, we're a small city, uh, slightly under 150,000 people and a county under just a half million. We have 1.6 million trees on all lands, providing 9.2 million in benefits and a 28% canopy. Uh, here's more of our urban forest and pictures. Um, you can see in the canopy by neighborhood, it, it varies by neighborhood. It's not equally distributed. Uh, and then from the surface, the surface temperature map, not a heat island map, you can see the hot spots and the cool spots. There's a 14 degree difference between them on this 79 degree day at 11 in the morning. And um, finally, there's our tree equity map which if you see the red paths, east and west and north, south, uh, that's where our highways are. And that was made possible by all the redlining that we did in the city of Syracuse. I've seen a couple other redlining maps in these presentations and thought it'd be good to show ours too, just to show that repeating pattern that we all experience in cities. In 1999, the Forest Service, you know, we have a Forest Service research station. That's where Dave Nowak was based out of until he retired. And they put in 200 eye tree eco plots in uh, 1999. And they remeasured them every five years. We benefited greatly from that. One of the things we found is that we had 890,000 trees in 1999, 7% buckthorn. Today we have 1.6 million trees, 21% buckthorn, and 7% tree of heaven. Natives have become a smaller share of our urban forest with that. They've increased in numbers, but they've been outpaced. And this speaks to our concern about urban forest resiliency uh, in our natural areas, which you'll soon see in some future photos. And the growth of buckthorn, though, is the only reason why our canopy has kind of hovered between 26 and 28% in the last 30 years. Our street trees, uh, since 1950, we've been removing more street trees than we plant. Only in the last decade have we gained ground. And that was because the county had to stop had to reduce combined sewer overflows uh, into Onondaga Lake. And to do, that, and to do that, they invested heavily in trees amongst other things. And with that, we planted about 10,000 trees over a decade that helped us gain ground. We're small forestry operation. We have eight full-time and two seasonal staff. We just added an urban forestry technician that is a project manager like me that was desperately needed. And, uh, we have a very experienced tree crew that focuses on emergencies and removals, and then we contract out most of the other work we do. Our budgets have grown, mainly taking advantage of a uh, crisis like Emerald Ash Borer and opportunities like green infrastructure and the American Rescue Plan and the pandemic. Uh, like many of you, uh, I think, you know, parks got in the spotlight as a hero during the pandemic. You know, we, everyone realized how desperately we needed parks. And when it came time to budget negotiations this year, uh, 
the director of budget and city hall said, told our parks department, you guys need to go big this year. And that's when we put in for the, the rotational pruning, which was $650,000, a lot for us, and also for streetscape improvements. Um, our community program, community, you know, the city depends on our nonprofit partners for community forestry programs, uh, for education, training, and stewardship. And, you know, those nonprofits wax and wane in their capacity. Um, for 15 years, we had a really robust collaboration with Parks, Cornell Cooperative Extension, Onondaga County, and the Onondaga Earth Corps. Changes at OAC has resulted in the law. Um, we expect to get back on track, but meanwhile, Onondaga Earth Corps is going strong. They plant about uh, 700 trees a year for us. Uh, they prune 2,000 trees a year for us. They're pruning all those trees we planted from the Save the Rain program, which was the county's green infrastructure program. So young trees, structural pruning. They maintain uh, about two dozen rain gardens for the city and the county, and they're implementing our forest restoration projects. Parks Department is working with OEC and a lot of other collaborators to reinvigorate our volunteer stewardship programs. We're excited about where we're going. Uh, we just haven't been able to roll that out yet. And I'm sorry for this, uh, this fuzzy picture, which includes um, uh, Sarah, formerly from American Forest. Um, the American Rescue Plan was a huge cash infusion for the city. Uh, about 26 million was used to help uh, stabilize a rainy day fund in the city, and the rest was used to apply to modernizing our infrastructure. Uh, we got two million to kick off to implement our urban forest master plan. Parks got an additional two million to uh, for park improvements and to update our facilities. It allowed us to, us, we, the city, to take over the management of sidewalks and to upgrade our water infrastructure, do neighborhood revitalization. Now the two urban forestry and neighborhood park improvements, those usually result in adding trees, but everything else results in a loss of trees. You know, we, we're going to be able to ramp and curve uh, and do temporary repairs around trees for our sidewalk. I mean, now they're repairing whole blocks, whole sections of sidewalk, but you know, bad species choices and placement decisions 40 and 50 years ago is just gonna make it really difficult to keep some trees around and that's gonna to contribute to loss. As will, I mean, working around water infrastructure, it's hard to keep trees. And uh, we'll talk more about the impact of housing on trees in a moment, but, the canopy loss continues. We just had an urban tree canopy assessment done comparing the NAEP imagery from 2013 and 2019. We saw 1% loss. The brown hexagonal show where that loss is. And that will accelerate because we lose canopy with every commercial development. You know, with zoning, you can develop 60% of the building foot of the property footprint and 20% for parking lot, at least 20% for trees. Uh, we're working on that with our design standards and we'll have to with our ordinance, but you know, some of this loss is quality trees like in this picture. Um, but a big challenge is increasing canopy in our low income neighborhoods is that many of the trees that need demolished and rebuilt, many of the trees they need removed and rebuilt just as much as any of the houses. Um, here's an example of the infill housing where there were some quality trees. And, um, you know, the biggest benefit of the master planning process for, for us, or one of them, was that each of the departments had a representative present at the stakeholder meetings, and many of them have now moved up into position of decision making. And this is what helped bring Kamon and my departments together to address the lack of a process to uh, identify trees and to protect trees and to remove uh, during this infill process, you know, which trees to protect or to remove and to plant after construction is complete. Um, so we're working on that process and we're finding it now. Um, so that brings us to our next steps. How do we start increasing canopy across the landscape in the face of all these expected losses? 
And you know, after we, re we released the final plan, uh, the stakeholders met again to discuss implementation. And private property and education programs are in the works and those are high priorities. But right now we're staying focused on planting street and park trees in our low canopy neighborhoods, breaking up concrete to beat the heat. And the city and its housing partners have begun to actively identify vacant lands to reforest. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples of those and then uh, turn it over to Kamon. We're planting about 1,000 street trees per year. We only plant where property owners approve. Uh, and that's a lot of work and everyone complains about it. But um, I like to hold fast to that because it really forces you to have a conversation with people. Um, you have to know where people are in order to know what will get them to change their attitude towards trees. Uh, but it really does add a big, a lot of labor to the process. Um, We'll continue to plant citywide by request, no matter where it is, but our door-to-door -door outreach, which is led by Onondaga Earth Corps to get approvals, is focused on priority areas like the south side, you're looking here at that. And, um, you know, 10 to 15% of our sites were amending, we're fluffing up the soil, adding organic matter. 65% of our trees are planted by the Onondaga Earth Corps with bare root trees. And then a traditional landscape company is planting the bottom burlap and doing the side amendments. Now to turn down the heat, uh, we're looking at business districts and areas that are targeted for investment in our low canopy neighborhoods. Those are our priority tree equity areas too. Two of them are shown here. I'll show a photo of South Salina, which, you know, there's a lot of business districts like this that have gone through streetscape improvements like this where there's nice building frontage, new sidewalks, and no space for trees. So this was before uh, there was good integration with forestry and, and other departments. But um, fortunately, the county had to get more stormwater capture in this CSO, and they had to tear up the whole street. So they did a great design that captures stormwater and provides space for roots. Um, they used a combination of silver cells and structural soils. They put the structural soils where all the lateral connections of water and sewer are. And um, you can see the during and the after. Uh, when I'm looking at the after, the only thing I wish they had done is done larger caliper trees and gotten rid of that weed patch in the curb for the photo. Uh, tree rip, pit retrofits, we do a lot of those in our downtown and in our business districts. We're no longer planting in the four by four tree pit. Uh, you can see that yellow line. We go to that area, we dig it out to three feet deep. We put structural soil in, we put the hardscape back. We make the tree pit wider. That's what you can see there. It's, it's gonna be a four by six tree pit. This will now have 384 cubic feet of rooting volume, not as good as the 800 that the trees in the previous slide are getting but uh, it's still way better than the 38 cubic feet that were there. That costs $5,000 when we do it as a retrofit like this, where we go pit to pit. But when we're able to line this up with a, a street improvement, a road rebuilding, that cost cuts in half. Natural areas restoration is something we've only been done, doing the last three years, but it's really important because um, it makes our natural areas more usable, gives us an opportunity to manage our invasives. And uh, here's an example of that. Schiller Park um, is an 11 acre forest that actually is in a nice canopy spot, but it is really an archipelago. It's an island of nature surrounded by homes. There is a low income neighborhood to the west of it and many new Americans settle there. And it's their first exposure to nature in the US. And when you go there, when I go there after work, I mean, it's swarmed with kids. And um, we're going to plant about 2,000 trees there. It's going to be a really good candidate for applying for city forest credits to get on their registry. And we just want to do a couple things before we do that. Here's an example of that. You can see the sea of buckthorn. Um, with some white oaks towering overhead. So the Onondaga Earth Corps removed three quarters of an acre. You can see under 
un, in the understory, there's very little vegetation, some bare soil, 150 to 200 year old white oaks. Then we had a contractor mow down the rest with a big drum on a skid steer. And we're gonna plant 1500 trees and shrubs this fall. That'll be led by Onondaga Earth Corps in the community. Uh, we got a, uh, a state grant uh, to do this work. It's about $330,000. We're gonna convert the whole 11 acres. And we did, we are using herbicide to manage the re-sprouting of buckthorn. We're gonna do that. We did it once, we'll do a spot treatment and that's all we'll try and manage the rest after that. So then there are the existing forests that are on our vacant lands. And, you know, a vacant land like this, they, they contribute a lot to our canopy. Um, but, you know, canopy for canopy's sake isn't good enough. The condition here creates a negative attitude towards trees. And our vacant land interventions need to address this. And our future, our future wonderful um, community forestry programs need to uh, counter the PTSD that living next to this site created because of our city's inability to manage all these vacant lots. Uh, but you know, people don't like to live next to this and, th and that's a hazard tree that is about to fall over and, and we force the property owner to remove it. But solving this problem is gonna be really important because half of our urban forest is this small patch that's less than an acre. Uh, probably a little, we think a little over half of our small patches are on these vacant lands and the rest are usually street trees. But, you know, other cities, I'm very curious how they're going about estimating this transition between canopy we're losing and canopy we're, we're gonna grow. Um, Cause I believe we're gonna lose more canopy before we start getting it. If we're gonna uh, uh, pursue this aggressive, aggressive strategy of reforesting a selection of our vacant lots. And when it comes to that vacant lots, and after this slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Camone. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of interventions to reforce these vacant lots. We, we feel as a city, we're good at community outreach and Camone is gonna show you, uh, talk a bit about our process of staying connected to the community, but um, one intervention that we're really excited about that's on a combination of parkland and vacant lots is the Syracuse Urban, Urban Food Forest Project that is a partnership between Syracuse University, which is a private university, and SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and Onondaga Earth Corps, and uh, Jubilee Homes, which are some nonprofits, and that is the plant uh, edible forageable plants in our woods and along our natural areas and in our vacant lots and involving the community in doing so. Um, we're also talking about making sure we make place making part of the process and when we're looking at populating these vacant lots with trees and um, while we work out how that process is going to happen the design we're going to pursue is going to match Philadelphia land cares which we see is very effective it just clean grass, flat corners, trees, wood fencing. It's easy to clean up. Illegal dumping plagues us, and um, and it's, we've got to make it easy to clean these places up. So that's my part, and now I'll turn it over to Kamal. Okay. Thanks, Steve. You can advance to the next slide. Awesome. So the Urban Food Forest Project is really one of many um, opportunities for us to increase tree canopy throughout the city of Syracuse. So in order to reach our goal of increasing canopy by 7% over 20 years, we first recognize that we need several departments at the table um, in a lot of ongoing planning things. Um, so first, we have a very large vacancy uh, within Syracuse, you know, credited to a lot of white flight that happened during the 70s. You know, so as people moved out to the suburbs and used the highways to relocate back in the city um, for work opportunities, um, we see that that left a lot of vacant properties. So now in the past 10 years, the city has done a lot of work to demolish a lot of the ones that are deteriorating. So now we have both a large vacant housing stock, but also a large stock of vacant land. So 
um, this provides us a great opportunity to increase urban tree canopy coverage. Um, outside of that, we have the Resurgent Neighborhood Initiative, which was an initiative launched by the mayor actually at the start of COVID. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. We also have the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, where the city is being awarded $10 million from the state to revitalize a commercial corridor in surrounding neighborhoods. And then we also have some larger, um, both public and private projects where we have a chance to have a seat at the table. So the deconstruction of Highway I-81 and the, um, the community grid that will be coming in, and then also Blueprint 15 and that development that's happening. So you can go to the next slide. So when we look at the deconstruction of Highway I-81, it's really a great example of a once in a generation project where we have an opportunity to have a really major impact on surrounding, surrounding communities, similar to its original construction. Um, so right now the photo on the left is what East Adams Street looks like today. And then the photo on the right is what we imagine the community grid to look like. So here you can see they have plans for a lot of street trees which will not only um, decrease like the speed of traffic, it'll also improve air quality in a high traffic area, um, but then also administer all those public health benefits to the surrounding community. So on the left side, we have a housing scheme. There are also some doctor's offices in this area. And then on the right side, you can't see it in this photo, but we actually have Upstate Medical and Kraus Hospital. Um, so, we really do have an opportunity with this coming down to rebuild the connection between the south side and the east side of Syracuse. So you can move on to the next slide. So actually right adjacent to Highway I-81 is what was once the 15th Ward. So the 15th Ward was a predominantly African-American neighborhood um, that was raised um, in the 50s and 60s to make room for the highway and to make room for public housing. So right now, uh, we have a nonprofit called Blueprint 15 that's working with McCormick, Fair, and Salazar to redevelop the entire neighborhood um, and bring in a mixed income, mixed use space. So um, with that said, they have plans to put in you know, new green spaces and connect a lot of the existing parks that are in that area. So this project is really unique because they're operating off of three pillars. So they want to introduce high quality housing, um, both affordable and market rate housing. Um, they also want to focus on health and wellness and then a really amazing education system where they're focusing on the cradle to college pipeline. Um, so we think that this is a really great opportunity for us to come in both on high quality housing and on health and wellness. So we are working with this team to identify sites for permanent green space within the neighborhood. And then we also um, are hoping to encourage them to put in as much tree canopy uh, within a concentrated area as possible. You can go to the next slide. Um, so outside of those larger projects, we realized that we need to look internally at a lot of things that are going on in the city. Um, so we wanted to ask what, what things are neighborhood and business development currently involved in where we can add trees to both the planning and the implementation stage. So you can advance to the next slide. So in Syracuse, we have a major, major vacancy problem, as I stated before. So we have over 2,000 vacant lots that are under favorable ownership, meaning it's owned by the land bank, it's owned by the city of Syracuse, or owned by one of our housing partners. So I'll just detail the land bank real quick. It was created um, for the city to have an entity to manage a lot of our vacant properties. So once a property falls tax delinquent, um, the city then goes to seize the property and it's transferred to the land bank, who then maintains and manages the property and then has the long-term goal of getting it back into productive use. Um, so since inception, they've sold over a thousand properties, which is great. Um, but with that said, there are also a lot of lots where they're non-buildable. Um, and that's defined by our housing partners building standards. So if the frontage isn't, I believe 40 feet and the depth isn't over a hundred feet, then they prefer not to build on those lots. So we have a large stock of those types of properties. Can go to the next slide. So what are we doing with it? One of our largest initiatives that our department is really excited about is the Resurgent Neighborhood Initiative. Um, so it's the mayor's plan to concentrate housing investments and code enforcement within targeted areas. So each side of the city, the north, south, east, and west, is assigned one city planner and one community ambassador. Um, and the community ambassador lives and works in the community. They gather information that is then shared up to city planners and then that information is then shared up to directors and department heads so that we have that constant flow of communication. So the community ambassadors actually came out of our kitchen table talks, which was 
sort of like a, a community engagement series we did last summer where we held 80 events where we paid participants to come and speak to us um, about their quality of life, their housing conditions, and then the relationship that they had with code enforcement. And out of that, we saw that a lot of people, when they have open housing, open internal violations, um, they prefer not to speak with codes or they have a bad relationship or they've had some bad experience. So that community ambassador was put in place to sort of be the liaison between um, residents with housing violations and the city of Syracuse. So um, say there's a complaint, they bring that to the codes department and then they follow that complaint from the moment the violation is cited to the moment it's actually addressed so that we can hold everyone accountable. Um, everyone from the residents just to be responsive to code enforcement to code enforcement to actually go out and cite the violation and then ultimately the owner to fix the violations. So right now we do have a really strong pipeline for um, getting information from the community back up to NBD and to other departments throughout the city. So with this initiative, we can move on to the perfect. So with this initiative, the largest thing we have in play is infill housing development. So with this large vacant housing stock, we're asking how can we hyper-focus um, housing development in areas that are prime? Um, so what our department did, we put together a block index where we rated each parcel in each block based on a plethora of criteria that make it more prime for development. So we looked at if it's located in a floodplain, we looked at if the city has site control or one of our sister agencies has site control. We looked at topography, um, the ability to put together clusters of land. We looked at zoning, occupancy changes, and then also community assets that were inside of the neighborhood. So we scored all of the blocks throughout the city um, based on this index. And then planners went out and actually walked the neighborhood and saw which are more viable for development. So the city has a plan to put in 50 single family and 75 two family homes within the next few years. So major question, where does the urban forest master plan ties in? It sort of ties in on fourfold. So firstly, we wanna leverage vacant lots in favorable ownership to increase tree canopy across the city. So um, if we look at the land that's owned by the land bank, that's owned by the city, how can we use that path of least resistance um, to establish permanent green space, but also clean up a lot of lots that you know, have problem trees or are prime grounds for dumping. So second, we wanna introduce planting new trees as a part of our infill housing development. So you know, if a family is moving into a home, they don't only want the home, but they should also have you know, trees so that they decrease their home energy costs and provide shade and provide also privacy. Um, so that's our second facet. The third, uh, we wanna address the existing tree problem. So, where are their problem trees um, that are a nuisance or at risk of falling on houses um, or that negatively affect quality of life within communities and how can we target those trees? And then lastly, we wanna introduce tree and root protection plans, especially with infill housing development. So, you know, as we have large equipment coming onto lots, we wanna ask how can we preserve the tree stock that we have as much as possible? Um, Steve mentioned this earlier, you know, as we put in tree canopy, we're also going to lose and that's something that we have to deal with but we're wondering how we can build out a process both between permits and nbd and parks where um, these protection plans are put in place before the development even begins uh, right so we wanted to sort of hyper focus on a neighborhood so we first began uh, with the south southwest neighborhood so it's a low-income neighborhood in an NRSA area or a neighborhood revitalization strategy area designated by HUD, and it has a history of low canopy coverage. So after meeting with stakeholders from the urban forest master plan, we then got to work and did some mapping and we analyzed, okay, where are the assets in the community? Where is um, current infill development happening? Where are there schools located nearby? Um, so we looked at a bunch of criteria, um, everything from considering whether parcels are viable for development. So what's the slope? Um, is it located in the floodplain? What are the lot dimensions? To so looking at geographic data, so land surface temperatures and current tree canopy coverage. Um, and then we also looked at proximity to recent investments, like I said before, so infill housing development, um, if there are plans for sidewalk reconstruction within the area and then new commercial developments happening. So following this idea of hyper-focusing on one area and putting in as much development as possible, we asked which lots are viable for tree planting. So we did wanna show you some photos of changes in tree canopy coverage over time. 
So this is a near west side in 1938 at 50% tree canopy coverage. And the next slide shows it currently. So this is a near west side today at 19% tree canopy coverage. So we thought that this would be a great place to pilot what a tree planting might look like. And also just for the city to work through what that process looks like um, in terms of who does what, who pays for what. Um, so just giving a, a little bit more detail, we are piloting a planting on 701 Tully. Uh, so the top photo shows what the lot looks like right now. We currently have site control, so it's been owned by the city. Um, on a walk with community ambassadors, someone notified us that this is prime, a prime dumping ground. Um, people come and dump mattresses, trash and debris, construction materials. Um, so we asked, how can we come in and uh, have some city intervention to avoid this? So our current plans right now are to fix the sidewalk and put in a fence um, that blocks off the area from dumping. And then we also have plans, I think it's also underway, um, that we removed a lot of problem trees and Steve might be able to speak to that a bit more. Um, but underneath, underneath that photo, we also have the Peacemaking Center. So that's only a block away from this lot. Um, a lot of youth hang out at the Peacemaking Center and a lot of service providers on the west side actually convene here and convene monthly to plan events. So it's a highly active area. Um, underneath that, within this area, we also have infill housing. So home headquarters put in these two housing structures um, recently. And then to the right of that, there's also a school um, less than a block away. So in looking at all these factors, we thought this would be a great place to pilot some planting. And in partnering with the Peacemaking Center, um, there are actually youth that wanna do some placemaking on the lot, which is awesome. And something we're super excited about. Um, so outside of that planting on 701 Tully, we also have the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, which is in the Southwest neighborhood. And we see it as a really great opportunity to intervene. <clears throat> so this is a larger scale um, intervention that we're piloting out. So right now, all of the yellow lots are located in the floodplain and um, some of the lots closer to the creek walk, which is this, it cuts through the middle. Some of those lots are prime dumping grounds. Um, so we have an email chain going on right now with SPD, the mayor's office, Parks and Rec, DPW, uh, where we're asking what intervention can happen. So right now our plans are to seize a lot of the delinquent lots that exist in the area um, conduct side lot sales where we can. So if there's a small parcel where a homeowner nearby doesn't have a backyard or a side lot, we're asking what can we sell off to them? And then outside of that, what lots can we remove problem trees on and make a permanent green space? Um, especially since it's in the flood area, it's not prime for development unless a private developer you know, has the capital to fund a project um, of that size. And then on the left side, that's actually South Ave, which is one of our busy commercial corridors where the downtown revitalization funds will be, be put in. So we even see along there, we have some vacant lots that are primed for intervention. So we're asking, how do we make this land even more viable for developers that might be interested in new construction of, on this corridor? So with all those initiatives, we realize the reality is that Syracuse is at a critical point in development. Um, Earlier, I said it's a once in a generation opportunity and we truly believe it is. Um, so we're trying to get Parks and NBD to have a seat at the table in all of the things that are going on. But sometimes the greatest challenges come from getting community buy-in. So say NBD and Parks identify a lot that's prime for development. Um, if the Common Council doesn't agree that um, that land should be used as a permanent green space, then they might not allow us to transfer it to the land bank or they might not um, they might not agree with that. So that's one of the struggles that we've come up against recently. And then also Steve mentioned this before, but there are some unavoidable losses where, you know, before you put in new tree canopy, we're gonna lose. So that is, that is my spiel. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you both so much. Um, there's definitely some questions in the chat, so I'll read those out when we're ready. Kinsey, did you wanna say some things? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you for that uh, great presentation. It was very informative. Um, and yeah, there are a number of questions. So I'll hand it over to Erica to bring those up. And if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question out loud, feel free to unmute yourself um, and shout it out. 
Yeah, so earlier on in the presentation, we had um, some great questions from um, persons from Erica, which is uh, how do you track your trees and how did you analyze your data to determine the one six rotation? Um, is that determined by the funding level? Um, the first question was how do we track our trees? We do that in TreeKeeper. Um, we just, that's our database. And um, we have a full time database manager as well. And we have a system for uh, getting sites onto our database, and then we just follow it through management. Um, and part of what we want to do when we start planning on private property is get that into our database management system too. Um, and then we also want to get more forward facing with our database so people can track that. But right now we're just kind of doing the nuts and bolts database management. And then one six rotation, it's a, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of feeling our way through that, but um, that seems to be like the sweet spot that industry is trying to do is six year rotation. I'm sure Dave Sivier will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it might be one six, one seventh. We'll know once the bids come out, but our plan is to put that out the bid for winter work and require that it be done in winter while it, there's leaf off. Um, we just think that'll help us with our prices. And um, what we did is we started re-inventorying one six of the city every year. And then we had a break during the pandemic. But so the bid that's gonna go out is for the one six inventory from three years ago, four years ago, actually. The idea is that we're putting out to bid what was inventory the previous year. It's just, you know, it's not easy to move a big giant uh, process like that, but that's where we're heading with that. Great work. And David says, haha, a six year pruning rotation is great. So a couple exclamation points for you there. Uh, no correction needed. Um, <laughs> the second question we have is was from Kinsey, which is, are the design standards you mentioned codified or are they suggested? I think this has to do with the, um, you were saying you're working on updating those. They are not codified yet. So um, one of the, we're going through a, a new rezone process and that's what it's called rezone. And that has been under works longer than our master plan. And I think the planning department just clawed it back from the review process because it was suffering death by a thousand cuts. Um, but one of the things we do in the zoning manual is in the zoning code is to say refer, refer to the manual for that subject matter. <clears throat> um, we have kind of been in our pre-development meetings, we say what a requirement is for development, and we don't lead on to the fact that it's not codified in the ordinance. We just say you have to provide uh, 600 cubic feet of rooting volume for every tree, and um, you have to do this kind of buffer. Um, but eventually, projects are going to come up where we're going to be challenged, and we're going to need that in the code. Uh, so right now, we just have a standalone design standard that we had a consultant do for us. Uh, we haven't linked it to an updated ordinance. We have a lot of work to do there because we're gonna go for some big things like mitigation money for tree loss that's put into a fund if we can't plant on that site. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, great, great stuff. Um, another question was who did the heat mapping for Syracuse? Well, um, that map was, I think, uh, the Vermont Spatial Lab did that surface temperature map. Um, we also have uh, some people at ESF that are doing heat island mapping and uh, giving us scenarios for what the heat islands would look like if we increase canopy up to 50% total tree canopy. Um, so we're gonna start relying on that more because it's much higher quality than that surface temperature map. So that was, I know it cost us like $500 to have uh, Jarleth Dun O'Neill facilitate that satellite beam flown overhead. And that was done in 2016 at 11 a.m. Awesome, awesome, good stuff. Um, the next one is from Kinsey, which was, what changes are you hoping for in your ordinance? Uh, the mitigation fund will be a big one, mitigating for what's lost. Uh, so that everyone recognized trees as infrastructure, you know. Otherwise, we'll, 
that that feels like that's going to be the so, most substantive uh, change. Uh, we are also going to increase our fine structure. The biggest thing right now is that in our ordinance, I have tried to find somebody for wanton tree destruction, not not because somebody who knew what they were doing and did it anyway. And then when I went to the police to um, enforce it, they the deputy chief said, you know, you're going to have to talk to the head of the law department because um, in my 30 years here, I don't think we've ever adjudicated a, a tree-based fine. And then the lawyer said the same thing. So, you know, the problem starts with us. We got to get serious about, about what that process looks like. So those, those are going to be the two, the two big ones because developers are going to balk uh, at a mitigation fund. When, when the county tried to get us to pass a stormwater ordinance, we had developers lining up at the public hearings against that. And we're going to try and find a way to get some change with help that much acrimony. Great. I see um, Erica, your hands raised. Go ahead. Hey, um, thank you, Steve and Kamal. And this is an awesome talk. And I, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, the, the, the second, the next two questions were from me about vacant land and the balance between development and um, how do you identify uh, lots for forestation, which you answered thoroughly. Thank you. But I think the question really for me is about like how it seems to me like it's a matter of priorities and personalities, how agencies can actually coordinate these things. Have you found that you've had like momentum that has gotten you to a place where you can do these large projects or you know, what was that relationship between the departments that are more on the development side and the parks department? Because we've, we've had a lot of conflict between those two conflicting priorities here in Philly. You want to that go question first, makes Kamal? sense. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Yeah, so the partnership between parks and NBD started off uh, very informally. A few of the planners attended the Urban Forest Master Plan stakeholder meeting or the launch. Um, and then Steve sort of reached out to our department and said, hey, you know, we want to take this a step further and start planning some smaller stakeholder meetings. Um, can we get together? So out of that, we then got to meet with different community partners like the land bank and people from um, Home Headquarters, which is one of our housing development partners, and Housing Visions, which they develop affordable housing. Uh, and then the conversation sort of just evolved into something where we were picking lots. Um, and then outside of that, we met, we did an internal meeting where we actually got all department heads together. So we had Parks and Rec, DPW, NBD, um, both the commissioner, the director, and planners from NVD. Um, and we said, okay, what does this look like in actuality? And we had a real conversation about funding and responsibilities. Um, and then outside of that, we agreed that the best way to figure out how to move forward with this vacant land management is just to pilot a planting. And that's sort of what we're doing with 701 Telly. So we're, I think we're still on the very early stages. And we hope that you know, our relationship develops to the point where you know, trees are as important as any other infrastructure that exists across the city. So if you know we're looking at sidewalks, how are we also considering trees? If we're looking at sewage and overflow, how are we also considering trees? I don't know if you have different thoughts, Steve. No, I have similar thoughts, Erica. Uh, I like that you clued in on that. That that was a slide I had and I took it out. Um, uh, you know, when I started, there was me and two guys in a bucket truck, and my first budget was Steve, we gotta have fire, we gotta have police. And the thing that you can't engineer for in this is, is personalities. And I think it helps that we're a small city. Um, and I would say right now, I've been in this position 12 years and it's the most tree-friendly environment we've had in council. Uh, some of the counselors participated in the urban forest master planning process. Um, when we were having an issue with tree removal requests at the 11th hour for development, I finally got frustrated and asked the developer, well, who's in charge of this project? And they said the head of economic and business development. And I went to him and I said, how can we stop this? And he said, you need to be part of the pre-development meetings now. And he's our mayor now. And so all these people I worked with before when they were not in positions of decision-making and now they are, and I think, 
you know, it's like I had I even had a slide with Dan Lamb and the now is the time for trees because it does feel like that right now that, you know, other departments are defending trees and, you know, you can't, I can say something, it's not the same as when you have somebody on the other side supporting your cause. So that's helped. Yeah, that, that's really interesting to hear. And I feel like in Philly, we're like a decade behind you because I, I feel like we're in that place where a lot of the people who are in middle management are very supportive, but um, once it gets up up to leadership, it's nothing's happening. So it's both encouraging and very depressing to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that it's the relationships we're making now that will, you know, fruit in 10 years. So, right. I mean, we, there's a whole bunch of us, the mayor texts us, do this, do that. And so it's, it's a lot flatter hierarchy, I think, in these smaller communities that it, it's got to be helpful for that when they, when they like what you're doing. Right. But I think that, I mean, Steve, you've been in Syracuse for how long now? 12 years. Okay. 20, yeah. 20 and, years. Yeah. I was going to say, I thought it was longer, but, and I feel like it's, you know, those relationships that you've built over time too. Yeah. So it's important. Just, I don't know. The more I do this work, the more I realize that it's like individual personalities can make such a massive difference to the work and the, and your success or failure. Great conversation, folks. Um, I think I think these are great. I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions, Kinsey. I think there's some conversation in the chat about you know that that six year rotation, but also David had said, does Syracuse have baseline storm incident data that can be compared against future storm incident occurrence under a proactive pruning program to demonstrate the improved urban forest resilience to climate change and public safety? So I think that's kind of a similar pruning question. Um, what we do do is monitor our callouts. And, and they've been up and down um, and we haven't dug deep into that. I will say uh, if it depends how good we are at making sure that our pruners are doing reductions rather than lion's tailing because sometimes our trees in such bad shape, there's nothing to prune back to and, and you can't prune the way that we know we should. Um, and you know, a lot of these contractors and even our crews still, still um, push back a little bit about the reduction kind of cutting that would reduce storm storm damage. Um, I saw Pete Smith ask the question about, can new trees be planted on vacant lots and places that allow them to remain once a lot is developed, developed with new housing or are lot dimensions too small? That's case by case, but what we're going to do, we, we are connected with the architect uh, that is often laying out what the house footprint will be, and we're looking at those plans um, before the install, so we can kind of anticipate that uh, w where we could put trees. Sometimes it's not going to always be in like what iTree would recommend when you use the whatever that module is to maximize benefits because just the space isn't going to allow it. But at least we know where trees will go after the house is installed and the commission, uh, Camon's boss has determined that we can use our American Rescue Plan funds to put trees in the ground after construction is done and the house is even occupied. The thing that we have to close the loop on is um, we, want, we want to be in a position where the homeowners accept this is part of the infrastructure, these trees, um, because sometimes people just don't want trees. Kinsey, I know we're super close to the end, but one more that I, I really like the question from Pete, is there a possibility of using certain lots as tree nurseries? I kind of was curious, um, Steve, like what is your supply chain like in Syracuse? Do you have trouble finding the trees to plant each year or are you good on that? Um, well, Kimona and I haven't talked about this yet, but the last slide she showed in the South Side neighborhood where there's a lot of vacant lawns we could assemble, there's an urban farm just right out of the picture and a new park as part of the Creek Walk. And um, uh, that is a place that I wondered, that I wanna talk with the community about, could we do an orchard there? Um, because it just fits in with all that's going on there. We have to deal with the soil issues to do that. But then, um, uh, what was the other part of that question? 
sort of oh, supply, supply chain. chain. Yeah, for um, urban forest planting. Our contractor gets bought on burlap trees, mostly out of the Northeast Ohio and the Western nurseries in New York. And then the bare roots we get through two sources. One is Schichtel's, and then across the street is Chestnut Ridge Nursery, which was Schichtel's had a breakup and now there are two nurseries. And then we try not to put all our eggs in that basket. We also have, we plant Missouri gravel bed trees and those are twice the cost of bare root, but it's a local producer of those. And they get their, their whips from out West and then they stage them for a year or two and we buy those. And the reason we do that is that with the bare root trees, you know, no matter whether you're planting 10 or a hundred, if they, they come on a day and you need those in the ground in five days, seven at the most, with the Missouri gravel bed, it's a local producer. So we call them up two days ahead and we get these real time orders from him and he delivers them to earth core. It just helps logistically. Um, so the Missouri gravel beds survive at a greater rate than the bare root, but the cost difference doesn't make up the, make it worth it if your only measure is cost benefit analysis. But there's a lot of other great benefits to having a local grower producing really great trees uh, that way. Thank you so much, great answers. All right, uh, with that, we're at 11. Um, so thank you so much, Steve and Kimon, for uh, your presentation. There was some really robust discussion that was happening, and I'm sure that uh, it will continue. Um, if anyone, does anyone want the chat log to be sent out? Because uh, there are some good questions yes. and answers in here that we can send along. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll we'll send that chat log out with uh, the email with the recording um, of this presentation. Um, which I should end. <laughs> um, here we go.